going to liven up the conversation here a little on what she said and move away from non-stop COVID chat and get to the things that really matter most to us, like sex. Joining me now is Jess O'Reilly, a sex and relationship expert with a background in education. Her research and passion involves teacher training in sexual health, and she volunteers in schools and universities to help bring better sex and relationship education to students across Ontario. Jess is also a television personality, author, podcast host with Sex with Dr. Jess, and international speaker who has facilitated hundreds of corporate workshops and retreats in 35 countries from Lebanon to Costa Rica. Welcome to the show, Jess. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I think the first thing I have to ask is what led you down this particular career path? Oh, it was a total accident. You know, uh, growing up, I wanted to be a clown at birthday parties. You made those balloons. And then as I got a little older, I assumed I'd go into law. And I ended up teaching high school, uh, you know, as soon as I graduated in the Toronto District School Board. And I was teaching at an alternative school. So our students were 16 to 20 years old. And they were coming to me every day with issues related to sex and relationships. So unplanned pregnancy, unhealthy relationships, abusive dynamics, uh, STIs, not knowing where to go for testing. And so I really just saw that there was this gap in the system. Uh, we as teachers did not have the supports we needed, right? So obviously, I mean, you can imagine you wouldn't teach math or English or history or geography without books, without a textbook, without a, you know, exercises for the students com to complete with those type of supports. And we have nothing. So, you're, you know, teachers are kind of thrown to the wolves to speak about this very challenging, but also very divisive topic uh, with no support. So I went back to do research to support teachers. And so brief interventions, we call them basically trainings for teachers at the pre-service level, because at the time, only 15.5% of teacher education programs across Canada offered compulsory sexual health education, which, you know, so we're missing the bulk of our teachers. So that that's how I fell into it. I didn't even know the word sexology was a word. <laughs> when I started studying, I really thought I would just be working in classrooms. And, and of course, that's not what I do now. I primarily work, uh, I'm a speaker. So I, I primarily work with either executives and entrepreneurs and their partners who want to invest in their relationships just as they invest in every other realm of their lives. Okay, excellent. So you talk about uh, figuring out a core erotic feeling. So can you explain to me what you mean by that? Sure. Yeah. So this is from, I have a new book called The Ultimate Guide to Seduction and Foreplay. And I just want to shout out my co-author so I don't take it all for myself. <laughs> I have a co-author named Marla Renee Stewart. And in this book, we, we explore a lot of erotic theories. So the core erotic feeling I define as the emotion that you absolutely must experience in order to potentially have sex. So without this feeling sex is off the table and it differs from person to person. So if you think of it like the five love languages, but broader and more nuanced, you may need to feel relaxed. I may need to feel powerful. Another person might need to feel confident. Somebody might need to feel desired or sexy or safe or respected or uh, you know, uh, appreciated or dominant or submissive. There are different feelings that really different people require. And so this doesn't mean that, that anytime I feel that feeling that I'll be in the mood for sex. But in the absence of that feeling, sex is off the table. Okay. So that requires, a, I, I would ima imagine, a far bit of retrospect, you know, introspection about what you need. So once you establish that though, then you want people to move on to an elevated feeling. Is that correct? Yeah. So you have to do some consideration to figure out your core erotic feeling. And then, uh, you know, uh, once you figured out what it is, you can make the lifestyle, behavioral, attitudinal, relational adjustments so that you can experience more of that feeling. And you can also help ask your partner to help you feel that feeling, but ultimately we are responsible for our own feelings. And so once you've figured out that core erotic feeling, uh, you may have it you know, taken care of. So I look at my marriage. If, if my core erotic feeling was feeling loved, the truth is I, I feel so loved in my relationship all the time. I know that this man adores and loves and, and totally has my back. And that's not you know, necessarily gonna put me in the mood for sex. That doesn't necessarily make sex really exciting. It makes it possible. But once you can address your core erotic feeling, then you can address the elevated erotic feelings that take sex to the next level. And that's when you can start exploring experiences in sex that might be 
a little subversive that might contradict your day-to-day -day persona. So you, you know, my core erotic feeling may be that I need to feel really loved, but I also might find that it's really hot and really exciting and exhilarating to feel a little bit of risk or a little bit of, you know, for me, for instance, I like a little bit of feeling inadequate because in, in the real relationship, I feel so taken care of and so loved and so honored that it's fun to play with those subversive emotions. Uh, and so, you know, every, again, everybody's different. If you look at kinky people, some kinky people can be turned on by feeling a little ashamed or a little humiliated. But that honestly, for most people, is because at the core of the relationship, they feel so loved and respected and have so much trust in communication. So, you know, oftentimes people talk about techniques and the first, you know, four books I wrote were ultimately about techniques. But techniques and positions and changing what you do and, and even role play, all of those things are fun, but without the emotional underpinnings of, well, how do I want to feel? Like when we think about our fantasies, what do you feel on those fantasies? It's not necessarily what somebody does to you. It's how they make you feel. Without the emotional component, sex becomes a little bit more robotic. And so, yes, the techniques are fun. And yes, you know, changing what you do can be fun. But if you really look at, you know, even role play and fantasy, we're really looking about an emotional exchange because every experience from driving to ordering a coffee to sex of course is an emotional one and and so in this in this book we're trying to have people delve a little deeper and really consider like what are your sexual values what's important to you where did you receive your sexual messages and you use the word and you hit the nail on the head it, it's introspection we don't spend a lot of time considering our own sexuality and then we're you know we're surprised when our partner doesn't meet our needs but not only are they not they not mind readers most of us don't know what we want and again yes pleasure is a part of it communication and connection is a part of it but ultimately this is really about a deeper understanding of yourself and your partner so I like that you say that you know like your partners aren't mind readers but you know I think women in general have a lot of trouble asking for what they want I mean we can go into a coffee shop and have no problem ordering a tall half-calf soy latte at 120 degrees and be very specific about that request, but throw us in a bedroom setting and that request, you know, being very specific and asking things, it feels awkward, I think, for some women. And, you know, some of it comes with age and wisdom and growth and some of it comes with comfort in a relationship. But, you know, how do, how do women get past that if they really are just feel that they're conditioned to not ask for that in the bedroom? Well, first and foremost, I think outside the bedroom, we have to get used to, um, you know, letting people down and asking for what we want and being a little bit selfish because we do live by this, you know, with this kind of martyr complex that we do everything and we're responsible for everyone. And part of that is sociocultural, but part of that is, is really on ourselves. Like we have in many ways put that on ourselves that things must be just so. So first, I think we need to start speaking up outside of the bedroom. And you mentioned that very particular order of the half soy, latte, low fat, all that stuff. You know, I can admit that I have trouble with that. Like, I don't want to put somebody out. I don't want this stranger barista behind the counter to judge me. And I have to learn to get over that. Because if I don't do it in a low pressure situation, like ordering a latte, I'm not going to be able to do it in a high pressure situation, like, or, you know, asking for what I want in bed. But then the next step, I'll, I'll say two things. One has to do with mindful touch and the other has to do with stop performing. If we read all of the articles and all of the books, it's all about how you can blow your partner's mind, take care of your partner. How about we just ask for what we want? How about we lie back and say, you know what? I'm not in the mood, but if you do this, I might get in the mood. Or, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling it right now, but if you try this technique or if you speak to me this way, or if, you know, we have to ask for what we want and learn to be selfish and not apologize for it. Uh, we often refer to it as empowerment, but I don't really see it specifically as empowering. I just see it as you know, humans who are interacting and taking care of one another. It can't just be about caretaking for others. And then a more specific step revolves around mindfulness. So I do, I have a course on mindful sex and it uh, online and you, you uh, people can check it out at happiercouples.com, but it's not even about sex. It's about learning to receive touch. Like what, we work our way from breath to visualization to emotional presence and eventually we get to non-sexual touch. And the first non-sexual touch exercise involves a hand and arm caress where you have to just sit there for 5, 10, 15 minutes and your partner caresses you and your only job is to receive pleasure. And most people 
don't know how to sit there without either the need to reciprocate or feeling guilt about taking or letting their mind wander, which is okay, your mind will wander. But I mean, I think the practice of, practice of mindfulness more generally, as well as some of these specific exercises where you learn to receive non-sexual touch first, um, it can really help you to get in the mindset to be a taker in bed. Okay. One of the things you mentioned too are sexual values. So how do we determine what our sexual values are? So is that, does that mean we won't do certain things or we, you know, how do we, I guess, get familiar with that with our, for ourselves? Oh, that's a great question. I, I think that part of what you're describing could be part of your sexual values. So what are my boundaries? What am I into? What am I not into? But also if we can dig a little deeper and say, okay, why is sex important to me? How much does sex matter to me? And then what are the psychological, relational, emotional, physical, practical, perhaps spiritual benefits that I would like to derive from sex? And those are big questions, right? Like each of those is a therapy session if you want it to be. And what do I hope to share or impart on my partner in all of those realms? So in, in the book, we've got hundreds of prompts for people's consideration. And I think if you could just begin with those, you know, what do I expect to get out of sex? Why does it matter to me? Here's the thing. Some people don't like sex and that's okay too. Now, some people don't like sex because they're not having good sex and other people just aren't into sex. Some people are asexual and that's a perfectly valid sexual orientation. And rather than you know pathologizing women and saying, oh, you have a low sex drive or something's wrong with you or let's give you testosterone or estrogen or you know maybe if you worked out more. I mean, sure, some of those things can be helpful to some people, but there are also people who aren't into sex and we need to be able to embrace that too. Now. One of the challenges is that, you know, if we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, before we start exploring these considerations, many of us have already committed to monogamous relationships and not really explored, you know, what does a sexual relationship look like to me? And so, you know, it can be more of a challenge if, you know, in you're 40 and you realize that, hey, it's not just that I have low sex drive, I'm just not into sex. How do I have that conversation with my partner? And so I think it's most important that we sit down with ourselves first and maybe take some notes or maybe journal or, you know, do a little bit of reading to really consider what matters to us. And that's how I think you can begin exploring your sexual values. Why does sex matter to you? How much does it matter to you? And what are the different types of benefits? You know, do you feel closer to your partner after? Do you, um, do you feel more relaxed? Do you just love the pleasure? Do you love letting go? Do you hate sex? And do you hate sex because it's just not your thing or do you hate it because your partner is not tuning into your needs or you're not communicating them? These are huge questions, right? And when we think about our intimate relationships, being what we claim to be the most important things in our life, right? If you ask anyone, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, if they have a job that they just do because they need to make money or if they're, you know, an entrepreneur who's super passionate about their work, everybody's going to tell you that their partner and their family are the most important thing to them. And if that's the case, then you need to invest in it and you don't get to invest in it once a year or, you know, on, on anniversaries. Cause we don't do that in health, wealth, fitness, any of those things. You can't work out on, you know, once a year and say like, Oh, I'm done. I'm good now. Right? You, you have to continuously invest. And that's what I'm trying to change, uh, especially with, with all people, but especially with younger people, to help them engage in all of these conversations before they commit to a relationship. Really okay. think about like, what are your values financially in terms of family, in terms of culture, in terms of religion, and of course, in terms of sex, because it all intersects. Okay. So if people want to know more then, because I think this is a very valuable, you know, uh, conversation people have to have to have with themselves, obviously, and with their partner. So if they want to know more, where can they find you? Uh, so you can check out the ultimate guide to seduction and foreplay wherever books are sold. And I do have uh, many interviews on my podcast where even my husband and I will try some of these exercises and it's the sex with Dr. Jess podcast available on all platforms. Okay. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jess. I'd love to have you back another time. It's a great conversation. Anytime, thank you.